Deb Raji, uh, I was introduced through, through Angus Galloway's, one of my PhD students. They've been working together on looking at the responsibility of conferences, like big machine learning conferences like NeurIPS or ICML or CVPR uh, in the vision space to, um, to consider the ethical implications of, of work that, uh, that's being submitted to those conferences. So what kind of oversight uh, do the program committees uh, provide? Uh, and this is sort of a, 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 a new development in a body of work that Deb has developed over the years. Uh, I, would, I would encourage you to go and view her, bio, her biography on MIT Technology Review's uh, top, uh, 35, top innovators under 35. Uh, she's accomplished a lot uh, in, the, in the relatively few uh, years she's been uh, in the field. And uh, she identified uh, issues around bias in the computer vision systems that were being developed at Clarify, went on to participate in the Gender Shades project, which we referenced earlier, and this uh, established the standard for doing audits of commercial uh, AI systems and uh, has spent time in a number of organizations, uh, including uh, being a mentor at, uh, at Google and uh, is now with the Mozilla Foundation. So we're delighted to have her and, and learn about her work. So welcome, Deb. It floor is yours. Hi, thanks for thanks for that. I feel like it's like every introduction is like a trip down memory lane of like what happened. Um, so yeah, I'm Deb, um, uh, and um, yeah, I'm pretty much like I got connected to this through Angus, who's um, an awesome collaborator of mine. Um, I think we met at SOC ML um, at Mila uh, one day, and we were both sort of interested. Um, uniquely interested. I don't think there were many other people very interested in this topic, but we were both interested in um, reflecting on ethical oversight in, uh, you know, like was mentioned, sort of the conference setting or the research setting in machine learning um, as we do research in addition to deployment. So to explain, a lot of my work is auditing deployments. So I look at, um, uh, you know, auditing machine learning products that are already out there in the world and affecting lots of people. Um, uh, so it was really interesting and fun to connect with Angus over sort of some of the ethical concerns around the research side of things. Um, and that's been an awesome project. Um, so thanks Angus for, for supporting that work, obviously as an incredible collaborator there and uh, connecting me to this community here. Um, so yeah, I, the topic of my talk today is sort of around audits, accountability and algorithmic justice. Um, it's going to cover a lot of work that I've done. Uh, while I was at the University of Toronto, while I was at the AI Now Institute at New York University, um, work that I did with collaborators at Google, at the Algorithmic Justice League, and at the Partnership on AI, so I've been around. Um, right now, I'm, I'm a Mozilla Fellow, which pretty much means I'm a free agent and can kind of filter through these organizations um, a little bit more fluidly and work with people a little bit eas uh, a lot easier. Um, as I go through the presentation and kind of describe my work, it'll become increasingly clear why there's so much jumping around that happens where audit work arises with different types of stakeholders in different types of contexts and environments and it truly is this kind of interdisciplinary endeavor um, involving you know very different um, types of stakeholders and of, of interest to, to very different types of stakeholders so it's been i've been really fortunate to have opportunities that give me that flexibility to work with different types of people um, and and kind of jump around in the way that i need to do this work uh, so thanks to those people for uh, allowing me to do that. <laughs> oh, uh, can I move this on? Um, so I always start with this quote, which is a very kind of basic quote, but it I like to remind myself of it to get grounded, which is, you know, don't say you're going to give a talk unless you know what you're going to say. Um, so I wouldn't have agreed to this if I didn't have a message to share. And I'm just going to start with what that message is. I'm going to start with the lesson and then kind of roll backwards into exactly what I mean. So um, my main message or, or a lot of what I'm about is this idea that there's urgency to um, AI accountability work because there's currently real people being affected. Um, I think sometimes it's really easy to think of AI or algorithms or machine learning or whatever you, you want to call it as a very abstract concept and the threats of that technology is a very abstract concept. Um, but um, as I will talk about, you know, a lot of my experience with auditing, reveals that this is a very widely deployed technology. It's affecting a lot of people today. And as a result of that, you know, because it's widely deployed, 
in ways that might not even um, operate in the best interest of those people, uh, it's incredibly important to treat accountability work uh, with a, certain, a sense of urgency uh, to address the issues that those people are going through right now. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the next point, which is that, um, you know, because it's so urgent, because these are real threats and not necessarily imagined or speculative, um, you know, any kind of intervention or audit we design in this space should actually truly aim to make a real world impact um, and can be designed to do so. So it needs to be compatible with, you know, the, the world we live in, which is a lot messier than some of the abstract notions we like to play with. Um, and it can actually be actively designed to accommodate the nature of the real world um, rather than sort of live in that abstract speculative realm. And that's something that we should actively think about as we um, formulate these audits and these interventions. So I wanted to start with um, you know, a couple probably familiar stories around engineering responsibility, which is this concept I've, I keep kind of returning to with this work of um, you know, some of you, if there's engineers in the room, I'm not sure with the iron ring, um, you might recognize the 1907 Quebec Bridge project, um, which was you know, the very typical story that's told to all Canadian engineers um, you know, for reference, I did my engineering degree at the University of Toronto, so I was told this story many times. Um, but it's pretty much this idea that, you know, the Quebec Bridge in 1907 was being constructed. It was one of the largest cantilever bridges in the world. Um, and uh, one of the lead engineers, Theodore Cooper, was, you know, very carelessly handling a lot of the calculations required for the construction of that bridge. Um, as a result, um, you know, the bridge collapsed during construction, um, you know, resulting in the highest fatality rate of any bridge construction project in the world at that point. So um, it was a huge tragedy, the, the collapse of the bridge, and it's a good reminder, it's told as a story of a good reminder of why it's so important as people, you know, constructing, uh, you know, uh, tools or constructing systems, in this case, this bridge, um, it's important to do so with a, a sense of due diligence and attention to detail for the sake of the protection and the well-being of everyone involved. Um, another sort of very common example of this idea of engineering responsibility um, is that of the Covert, 1967 Covert, um, in the book um, Unsafe at Any Speed. And it's pretty much an example of General Motors had created this car um, and the car, um, the brakes of the car were not very well designed and not very well tested and evaluated and then widely deployed resulting in several deaths. Um, as a result, they had to eventually, after a thorough investigation, recall the car, and it was this whole scandal that happened uh, in the late 60s. And it was really prompted by this sense of if you're building this tool, this, this machine, this device, and you're widely deploying it, um, you know, there's a certain due diligence required. Again, you have a responsibility to take care of those that are going to be affected by this system. So, you know, we're seeing collapsing bridges in the machine learning space all the time now. Um, uh, you know, as was mentioned, I spent some time um, early on on the applied machine learning team at Clarify, which is a computer vision company. And I remember how we would be constantly making these small decisions that would end up completely um, defining the, 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 the outcome of the, of the machine learning product that we would deploy. And we, and you know, whenever I see these headlines, so you know, Amazon has an AI recruiting tool that's biased against women. Um, you know, voice assistants have problems with strong accents. You know, dermatology tools that don't work on darker skin. I recognize, um, to some degree, a, a little bit of that engineering responsibility problem, where at the time, no one was really testing for bias. We didn't really have a sense or an articulation or an understanding of what our data was and where our data was coming from. Um, and as a result, as AI systems became more proliferated and more common, um, a lot of these issues began to arise. And there was kind of this necessary attention that had to be paid to the issue of bias and other abuses and other harms that arose from the deployment of these systems. So um, that's sort of what led to this work in algorithmic auditing. It was a way, it was a check and balance pretty much to try to assess the performance of these systems and tr for the protection of those that are impacted by it. So I'm gonna start by clarifying what sort of constitutes this algorithmic auditing, algorithmic justice work within the broader landscape of conversations around AI and society. So, you know, often when I come into um, rooms uh, to talk about, you know, or I mention the word ethics or I mention the word AI and society, 
um, uh, I'm often confronted with these um, sort of machine ethics type proposals of, oh, so you work on situations where you have a car and it's trying to figure out if it should you know, hit the baby or hit the old woman and um, setting up these sort of trolley problem type challenges and conceptualizing that as the real ethical dilemma of the AI space. Um, and, you know, practically speaking, you know, you know, conceptually, that could definitely be a problem in this space. But, um, you know, as this article states, there's only about 1,400 self-driving cars um, tested by about 80 companies across the U.S. and often tested um, in, like, low-populated areas. Um, so the impact of that self-driving car is actually not um, – self-driving cars, although a, a big focus of some, some of the um, scholars in this space – is more of a speculative harm. It's not necessarily something that we're experiencing yet. Um, whereas a lot of the work or a lot of the, the work that's more connected to um, algorithmic auditing is looking at systems that are already widely deployed. So for example, this was an algorithm that was deployed in California um, affecting over a hundred million people um, in order to assign patients to beds. So, um, you know, a patient would come in and the algorithm would assign the patient, uh, would, would sort of give the patient a score that would determine whether or not the patient would be admitted or would be turned away for at-home care. And uh, it was discovered that this algorithm actually um, over-predicted uh, the, the risk of white patients and under-predicted the risk of black patients, putting them at greater risk of being turned away disproportionately. Um, so this bias is something that, you know, had already been impacting 100 million people a year. Um, this was a system that was already widely deployed. So we're out of the realm of a speculative risk and we're looking at a risk that is experienced that is, that is affecting people today. Another example of the kind of algorithm that we would look at as part of uh, our auditing work would be sort of the A-level algorithm. So, um, you know, this year, given that there was a pandemic, a lot of uh, students across the world effectively were not able to sit for their final high school exams. Um, and in some districts, um, especially throughout the UK, so Ireland, uh, Wales, uh, and all, all of these others, a lot of European districts, um, they would actually use an algorithm to assign grades. So the way that the algorithm would work would be give, based off of the grades that your teacher gave you, um, and, you know, the history of scores for your particular region um, and the history of, uh, you know, performance um, of your particular school, um, they would adjust the grade that your teacher gave you. So they would either downgrade it or upgrade it um, and give that as your final score. So, you know, obviously uh, this became incredibly problematic. Low income areas and low income schools, public schools um, were disproportionately downgraded versus private schools and high income areas. Um, and uh, people were very upset and it affected, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Again, this is a realized harm. There's nothing speculative about it. Um, and uh, it led to widespread protests, actually, that really um, changed the conversation in the UK about how algorithms would be able to um, interfere with people's lived experiences. Uh, and the other thing about this situation as well is it led to serious consequences. You know, some people uh, lost college offers. Their lives were irrevocably affected by um, the deployment of this algorithm. So um, the way that I like to describe this difference between kind of that speculation and the reality of what we see in the, you know, when we do this audit work is that the you know, speculative harm sort of re resembles Sophia the robot. Um, and I'm not sure if people are very familiar with Sophia, but Sophia is this humanoid looking, you know, very slick robot. Um, uh, and it's often, you know, displayed uh, as like an example of like the advancement of robotics, very complicated uh, on the surface and, and you know, um, seems to be uh, the, the sort of vision of what robotics is. Whereas there's only really one Sophia, I think at most two or three. Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, Sophia the robot isn't making a lot of impactful decisions. And as a result of that, you know, if Sophia makes a mistake or if Sophia messes up, it's not necessarily a consequential outcome. Whereas, um, you know, the Roomba is one of the most widely deployed robots uh, in the States. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands sold every year, uh, over I, like over a million, millions, I think, uh, definitely um, in homes across the U.S. Um, and the Roomba is definitely a simpler system than the Sophia. You know, it's not necessarily a, a super sophisticated machine. 
Um, but the fact that it's in so many homes means that it is very impactful. You know, if all the Roombas were to malfunction in a very significant way, that would be something that would be felt across the nation. So um, that dynamic between a Roomba versus a Sophia is a lot of what we encounter when we shift from these speculative harms um, of AI as sort of an abstract vision into this realm of, you know, the lived experiences of people and the types of algorithms they're interacting with on the daily. Um, you know, another interesting thing about dealing with real world uh, machine learning systems or real world algorithms and trying to audit for those is that, you know, it, the, the scope of concern increases, it becomes a lot bigger. So, you know, typically, uh, if you look at a machine learning paper, the focus is on that algorithmic development. So we, we are focused on the metrics for performance, and it's usually dependent on the nature of that algorithm itself. You know, the input data is considered a fixed problem. Um, the way that results are interpreted are considered fixed or assumed. Whereas in the real world, um, a lot of the challenge comes from the data um, and the way that features are generated. Uh, or the way that the problem is formulated or the task is designed. Um, a lot of the issues might arise from the way that results are interpreted or interacted with, um, uh, or the way that um, a result might persuade certain users to, to, to take specific actions. So that, you know, that necessary preparation and that impact, uh, you know, is really what we're focused on beyond just the typical, you know, scope of the machine learning contribution or the algorithm and the typical metrics and experimental results that we would uh, typically care about. So that's another thing that changes when we look at real world algorithms is the scope of concern widens a lot. Um, you know, and one of the big ways that this becomes, uh, you know, felt is when you think about how these algorithms interact with the legal landscape. So one of the big challenges of uh, working with or auditing real world algorithms is that there's a deep interaction between these algorithms and the law, and we notice these um, points of disconnect. So as an example, with Amazon's hiring algorithm where it discriminates against you know, hiring women, you know, that's theoretically illegal. You're not allowed to do that. But because it's an algorithm making that decision, it falls into this gray area. Uh, similarly, there was an algorithm that was setting automatic pricing for um, uh, Princeton Review, which is sort of a test prep service. And it was found to be um, you know, biased towards increasing uh, performance or increasing the price for particular zip codes correlated with racial demographics. Um, and you know, price discrimination is a real thing. It's definitely illegal, but because that decision is being made by an algorithm, um, again, very difficult to pursue that case. Uh, and then the other thing I'm gonna say about auditing just uh, for the sake of context and scope is that uh, the, there's sort of two types of audits. So, within the company, you have these internal auditors and they're separate from management, they're separate from sort of uh, the engineering team. They're sort of these uh, internally independent, there's this, it, they're usually this internally independent group um, that's meant to monitor the development process of the system um, and assess the performance of the system. And that's very different from an external auditor who's outside of the company completely can only see things, you know, has only a limited view of how the systems perform or work um, um, and have different obligations and different interests completely, but is equally independent from that engineering and development team. So I want to just clarify that. And, um, you know, fits very well into the language of audits outside of machine learning. So this is, you know, the three lines, the, the notion of three lines of defense um, is something that's very well known in the auditing world outside of machine learning. So, you know, within the financial auditing space or even the government auditing space, they use this language of an internal audit being, um, you know, the most, um, uh, the most uh, distanced from the engineer and what the engineer is doing um, and closest to this idea of an external audit while still being within a company. Oh. So just to like break that down a little bit more, um, Internal auditors are sort of the, those internal responsible innovation teams you see at like IBM, Microsoft, Google, um, you, Accenture, which is a technical consultancy group, might infiltrate a company and become an internal auditor. Um, same with Orca and other consultancy groups. Um, so they ha they're just given direct access to the system. They usually do their audit or start their audit pre-deployment. Um, it's usually executed by employees or people that are paid by the company. 
and they focus a lot on compliance and control. What they're trying to do is they're trying to make sure that the system is compatible with the set of principles or a set of laws um, uh, and guarantee or assure a certain amount of risk is mitigated. Uh, whereas the external auditor are, you know, people like the Algorithmic Justice League, where I work, where, so like advocacy groups, uh, ACLU, Government Accountability Office in the U.S., uh, FDA, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. So those are sort of groups outside of the company completely. They have indirect or customer level sort of access to the system. Um, they often deal with the systems once they're already out there in the world. Um, and executed by independent third party groups, um, not paid by the company in any way usually, um, and focusing on protecting uh, represented groups. So they're focused on protecting maybe not even the customer, but um, an affected population that might be even separate from the customer or the user. So, um, you know, a lot of the work that I've done so far, a lot of the, what are, a lot of the work that we've done that's very visible um, is our work on facial recognition. Um, so in the context of what I said around, you know, the scope of audits, um, this facial recognition work squarely fits in, where facial recognition is something that's widely deployed in airports, in schools, at Rite Aid, um, you know, used by, deployed uh, in C through CCTV cameras and used by, um, you know, thousands of police departments across this, the U.S. affecting 64 million Americans. So in, 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 in this, this sort of scope of, in the scale of uh, its impact, uh, it's definitely a, a harm or it's a system, it's an AI system, AI powered system um, that affects people already. It's already definitely impactful and it's a realized harm. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the other sort of reasons that we know that facial recognition was a good target for initial work was that people were already very nervous about facial recognition. There were a lot of lawsuits coming out. Um, some of them just anchored to common concerns around privacy. Um, but a couple of them really focused on this issue of disparate performance. So um, Uber drivers um, suing about, um, you know, facial recognition software that didn't work for their particular skin type. Uh, tenants sort of seeing facial recognition as an opportunity for a landlord to exploit them. So people were very clearly paying attention to this technology and concerned about um, its performance and its functionality. So it was, that also made it sort of a good area of focus for us and our work. So, you know, the role of algorithmic auditing here, as a reminder, is that it's meant to hold these AI systems accountable. Um, you know, these are widely deployed systems. In this case, uh, specifically thinking about facial recognition, this is a system that is affecting millions of people. Um, how do we actually get a sense of how well the system works and hold it accountable in the way that it needs to be um, uh, sort of scrutinized? Um, so that was, that's really the goal of what we're trying to do with uh, algorithmic auditing, but there's certain challenges. So uh, for context, you know, the idea of an algorithmic audit um, from an external stakeholder point of view, especially um, uh, where the system looks like a black box and you don't really have access to what's going on inside, um, you know, that's not a new idea. It's not a new concept. It's something that um, has existed since forever. Well, not since forever, but it's, it's been around. The, the concept or the idea of algorithmic auditing has been around for quite a few years, um, since around 2010 in the HCI community and in investigative journalism, um, there's al always been attempts to sort of look at different systems and try to assess or evaluate the performance of these systems with respect to bias or other concerns. Um, you know, but that being said, you know, a lot of these audits would struggle to translate into any kind of genuine accountability or um, change in corporate or public perception of these technologies. And it was really because of these key challenges. So one challenge was this idea of benchmark bias, where a lot of the test sets being used um, were inherently skewed. And thus the understanding of what performance looked like for a particular product um, was always through that lens of the benchmark and thus um, never really clear uh, how bias would play out. Another sort of challenge of algorithmic auditing was this this issue of accessing the target so it's very difficult um, to isolate the actual machine learning model um, and get to uh, the actual you know the subject of your inquiry um, usually things were wrapped around you know um, user interfaces and other elements of an online application for example that might make it difficult to figure out what part of the system is actually impacting your outcome or your result 
another challenge is this idea of a lack of public pressure. So um, based off of the construction of these um, initial audit studies, who would name um, you know, one target or not name any targets at all, um, the public just didn't respond to it and neither did the corporations. Uh, and then the final, the final sort of challenge was, you know, if the corporation did result, did, did react to it, and this was mostly felt in the investigative journalism space that was trying to do this work at the time, um, if corporations did react to the audits, it would be a hostile corporate reaction. So, uh, you know, it would be a situation where the company was uh, not very friendly and would sort of threaten the research or try to undermine the results in some way. Um, so these are all things that made it very unattractive to do auditing work at the time. And uh, also, more importantly, you know, made it very difficult for that audit work to translate into meaningful outcomes and meaningful accountability for um, the people developing these systems. So the, the question we came in with was this question of how can algorithmic audits be designed to address these challenges and lead corporations to mitigate bias concerns? Um, and that's really what led us to gender shades, um, which we sort of phrased as an actionable audit. The actionable part emphasizing our desire to design an audit that would result in some kind of um, behavioral change for the companies or for the public. Uh, so we wrote a paper, I encourage you to check it out, where we kind of delve into the details of, of the design of that particular audit. Um, but at a high level, uh, the Gender Shades project was a study, it was an external audit, so again, um, versus an internal audit, it's an external audit uh, of a and multi-target in the sense that we were looking at multiple companies, black box in the sense that we didn't have access to the systems, um, and we were looking at this, these application program interfaces, which are sort of these, you know, models, machine learning models as a service that were integrated into um, the applications that were, the products that were being deployed by these target companies. Um, and what we were auditing for was the performance on the facial analysis task of binary gender classification. Um, and the way the task is formulated is defined by the companies that we audited. So um, in order to address the challenges, we took inspiration from um, you know, other fields, uh, anti-discrimination law, HCI, uh, the finance industry and information security, to try to address some of the, the challenges that I had described earlier. So, um, you know, for example, to address the benchmark bias issue, we really thought about intersectionality and representation within the, the evaluation set or the test set that we were using to execute the audit. To think about the access to target issue, we adapted an HCI model, auditing model called the Suck Puppet, Puppet Audit, and we try to adapt that for the machine learning space. Um, to address the public pressure issue, um, you know, we followed sort of the lead of financial audits and publicly named multiple targets. Um, and I'll kind of explain later as to how that played out. Um, and then to address the hostile corporate reaction, we looked at information security. So information security actually has a very symbiotic dynamic with companies that they call out. So, um, you know, to just be on the same page, you know, if you find um, a security bug within a piece of software, um, there's avenues and procedures available for you to be able to report that vulnerability to the company without that company getting upset. So we followed a lot of what the recommended procedure was from that community in order to inform how we would move forward with our work so that we would avoid uh, a lawsuit effectively. <laughs> So um, to deal with the benchmark bias issue, like I mentioned, we, we looked at that, we, we sort of got inspired by that concept of intersectionality, and we uh, proposed this idea of a user representative test set. And the idea behind this is that you identify the different communities that you're worried about. So in this case, we were worried about, um, you know, uh, the intersection of uh, sort of the, the gender present, the, the gender and um, the sort of skin type of uh, the different individuals, so how dark or light their skin was, and we looked at, you know, what would the performance of the system be on, like, the darker female skin type versus the lighter male skin type, um, and try to actually balance our test set with respect to um, a user representative sample of each of these uh, communities that we were worried about. So as a result, we ended up with a test set that was about half male, half female, and half darker skinned and lighter skinned. And it seems like a very simple step, a simple decision to make, 
but um, PPB, which is the pilot parliament's benchmark, which is our benchmark, um, is much more balanced with respect to representation of male, female, and lighter, darker skinned than every other sort of mainstream facial recognition benchmark, which is highlighted here. Um, and we think there was the, the reason for this is just the, the intentionality behind the way we crafted the benchmark itself. Um, so because we were very intentional about representation, we ended up with a much more balanced representation than a lot of these other benchmarks where, um, you know, in some cases they were up to 95% lighter skinned um, and, you know, up to 77% male. Uh, the other thing I mentioned around the access to the target is this adaption of an HCI audit design methodology. And I don't want to get too much into the details of it, but um, the TLDR is that um, rather than auditing the end application and posing as a user, we posed as developers and we looked directly at the model itself. And what this did is it just isolated the machine learning model from any kind of other product that the model would be integrated into. And it allowed us to critique the model directly. Um, and that was made a lot easier by these, um, these companies providing uh, their models as these, these API products. Uh, the other thing in terms of building public pressure was that we named multiple targets for the audit. So we named for the initial, um, the initial audit, Microsoft, Facebook Plus, and IBM. So typically um, in, in audit studies in the past, uh, the audit targets would not be named. You would usually have like company A, company B, company C, um, or if the company was named, it would just be one company. Um, and the reason for that was concern around litigation. Um, and what we discovered by studying the way that it works in finance is that by actually naming multiple targets, you create this sort of competitive dynamic between them. So, um, you know, once we released our results and Microsoft or IBM responded, then Face++ Plus Plus felt like it had to respond. Um, and additionally, by naming all of these targets, um, there's a little bit of uh, public interest that arises where suddenly um, uh, it, it surfaces as a broader issue than just one particular company. Um, and uh, there's less of a litigation risk. So that was something that we experienced as well. Once we named these targets, um, it became this huge press story. Um, and we witnessed that competitive dynamic emerge where once IBM responded, Microsoft felt like it had to respond and Facebook Plus Plus felt like it had to respond. So it actually um, activated the companies to take action. And then um, this idea of dealing with hostile corporate reactions um, was we implemented this idea called the coordinated bias disclosure. And I can't get into like the details of it, but it's something that's borrowed from the way that you um, disclose vulnerabilities to companies, um, where you talk about, you know, if you find a security risk in their software, for example, there's a very specific process that you go through to communicate that to the company, give them a particular deadline before you communicate it to the public. And there's like thorough documentation justifying this methodology. So when we followed the same steps, um, it was again, sort of great protection against the companies getting really upset at us because, we had informed them with enough time, we had given them their deadline, we had communicated the whole way through, um, and it was just another way to really protect ourselves from a hostile corporate reaction. So the big question after doing all of this work to design gender shades in a particular way was, you know, was gender shades impactful uh, in terms of changing corporate behavior? Um, you know, did the companies actually adapt their products as in response to gender shades? to address the issues that we, um, that, we, that we articulated in that initial study. So, um, you know, in terms of what they said, they said that they had made these improvements. So we had Kairos, IBM, Microsoft all make statements. Oh, and sorry, just to like explain what happens here, gender shade study happened. We did the audit in May, 2017. And then about a year later, we audited the targeted companies from the initial audit uh, and then audited two other companies that were not initially audited. And the point of doing this was really to reflect on if our initial audit had um, resulted in uh, different corporate behaviors for the companies that we had initially audited. So yeah, the companies were very vocal about their support for this work and um, you know, addressing these issues, but we were very curious to see, um, to test and to see what would happen. So, you know, uh, this is the overall accuracy on our benchmark for each of these target and non-target companies. So as you can see, the target companies, um, you know, after the year have improved performance on the overall benchmark 
Um, uh, and the non-target companies are sort of performing at um, you know, 2017 levels uh, for those target companies. So you have a, a clue here that perhaps the target companies did respond to the gender shades um, audit, the initial gender shades audit. Um, and for reference, um, we did not, uh, we did not uh, release the benchmark. So this whole time, no one had access to the benchmark. So, um, you know, this is accuracy broken down by gender. So you can see that the chart for the target companies, the gap between performance on female and um, uh, on the, the female faces and male faces went from about an 80 to 21% error gap to a one to 9% error gap, meaning that um, the, the difference between performance on these two groups um, was definitely uh, minimized. And for the non-target companies, you can see that there was still a persistent gap between performance on female faces and male faces, about 14 to 18%. Uh, we see a similar dynamic or similar trend happen with respect to skin types. So the darker faces, performance on the darker faces versus lighter faces, you could see that um, in 2017, there was about a 12 to 19% error gap between performance on those two groups. And that got minimized to just a gap of one to 7%. Um, whereas for the non-target companies, Amazon and Kairos, that gap between darker and lighter skinned individuals was, um, you know, uh, a performance gap of 8 to 12 percent. So sort of the key contribution of gender shades was this idea of um, an intersectional uh, analysis of performance. So looking at um, performance on each of these subgroups that we cared about in our user representative benchmarks. So this idea of looking at you know, how well did the system perform for darker females, lighter females, uh, darker males, lighter males. So Microsoft, you can see that um, the performance between 27, the 2017 audit and the 2018 audit, a lot of the improvement that we witnessed was actually happening to this, the performance on this darker female subgroup. So they went from a 79.2% performance on that group to about a 98.5% performance. And that's what's responsible um, for a lot of the improve, overall improvement that we saw on the benchmark. Uh, same with Face++, they went from about a 65% performance on the darker female subgroup to a 95% performance, even though uh, performance on the lighter male subgroup was kind of consistently a 99%, revealing that it was really performance on that darker female subgroup that's responsible for their overall performance improvement. Um, and then we saw a similar trend again with IBM. Um, and, you know, most critically for the companies that had not been initially audited in 2017, um, they still sort of maintained this gap in performance between the darker female subgroup and the lighter female subgroup um, uh, in the second audit, um, revealing that, you know, the, it's the target companies that were really the ones that had um, minimized that gap and um, become performant on this darker female subgroup, while non-target companies, companies that were not initially audited, um, still had, um, sort of this persistent gap of performance. So um, I'm gonna just very quickly go through what we, what I think anyways, we can learn from gender shades. I think there's, a, there's definitely a lot and I wouldn't, I won't be able to go through everything in 15 minutes, but I wanna just make um, a couple points of things that I've learned from gender shades or I wanna communicate. So the first lesson is that if it doesn't work for everyone, um, it doesn't actually work at all. So um, seeing audits as assessments and evaluations where, um, you know, really redefining performance through the lens of what it means to perform for the most, um, you know, for, for the most neglected or underconsidered group. So if I, you know, search beautiful skin on, you know, Google images, I see something like this. Um, and, you know, there is often this narrative of this dichotomy or this um, tension that might exist between, um, an abstract notion of accuracy and fairness, where um, I have to sacrifice some accuracy in order to make my system fair. But the reality is, you know, this is not a system that works. In reality, you know, men can have beautiful skin, darker skinned people can have beautiful skin. This is not an accurate result. Um, so, you know, that compromise um, doesn't really, it's, it's sort of an imagined compromise where if your system is not actually functioning for a marginalized group or an underrepresented group, um, perhaps we need to redefine our definition of accuracy and reflect on the fact that it might not be, it might just be a dysfunctional product and not be working in the way that it needs to. It's giving us the wrong answer. So again, um, you know, with 
our with PPB, uh, we found that a lot of um, a lot of what we discovered or what we were sort of what we were what was sort of being presented as oh you know there's fairness issues in facial recognition um, actually just revealed that we were not evaluating performance for a particular group. Again, you can see PPB compared to the other facial recognition data sets in the space at the time, um, really having more representation of that darker female group. And thus, as a result of that, um, revealing performance on that group. Oh, um, yeah, so this was from the initial gender shade study. And again, you can see that the darker female subgroup is a group that it just didn't work for. So um, when people started replicating our studies, this is uh, a replication from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, you know, what they found was that, you know, a lot of these facial recognition products just do not work for people of color. So the NIST study, um, found, and this is a, you know, a different facial recognition task of facial identification and verification. So not a classification problem, not a facial analysis problem like what we had audited. Um, they still found that Asian and African American people were up to 100 times more likely to be misidentified than white men. Um, and similarly, you know, with facial analysis, with the facial analysis task, which is that classification problem, people are finding um, bias in all different kinds of ways. So people are identifying, you know, a lot of these facial expression data sets not functioning in the way that they claim to be. Um, a lot of facial recognition products failing with the introduction of masks. So um, a lot of our work really just revealed the fragility of the claims of, uh, you know, facial recognition being a thing that works. Um, initially, uh, as well, there was also a, re a really interesting set of, at around the same time, um, some studies, um, and this was um, the UK, the UK police sort of uh, had their facial recognition system audited by um, an advocacy group called Big Brother Watch UK, and they found that um, the facial recognition system deployed by the UK police failed 81% of the time, um, and, uh, you know, this is a staggering a failure rate. There was also an, a similar audit that was done in New York where they found that the system, um, you know, failed 100% of the time, meaning that um, it detected no faces accurately. So um, these are sort of pilot studies in the wild studies where they discovered that this is a system that perhaps just doesn't work. Um, and not just work, it's not even that it just doesn't work for everyone, but it just doesn't functionally operate in the context of the real world deployment. Um, and again, yeah, um, another sort of study uh, validating our results and um, evaluating these commercial systems and understanding how the way that the information that feeds into them sort of shapes the nature of the context where it does or does not work. Um, and again, another sort of uh, reproduction of our study looking at, this was more of a demonstrative um, result for um, that the ACLU conducted where they ran Amazon recognition on members of Congress, and they found that there were a disproportionate, almost double the number of false matches for people of color. So audits are a great way to just kind of highlight um, that these systems are not functional in the way that they should be, and that if it doesn't work for, um, you know, those that are, you know, uh, often neglected in the evaluation of these systems, then it doesn't work at all. Uh, the, second, the second sort of lesson learned through Gender Shades was this idea that um, ignorance is bliss, but irresponsible, <laughs> meaning that audits can really serve as a spotlight um, uh, for accountability. Um, you know, once we audited the target companies, uh, there was a lot of press and a lot of attention paid to those specific companies. So we actually had this kind of um, uh, power to kind of control the narrative around, um, you know, by virtue of auditing a particular target uh, or including a particular company in our audit, we were able to highlight um, you know, the, the limitations of that particular product um, in a way that held them more accountable than they had previously been. So, um, you know, for one thing, no one was able to say this again. So this is a quote from um, Mr. Thies, wh who is the Director of Algorithm Development at Cognitech. Cognitech is um, a less popular sort of facial recognition system uh, or a facial recognition company, they build facial recognition and surveillance products. Um, and at the time, in defense of the industry, he was saying, well, it's harder to take a good picture of a person with dark skin than it is for, <laughs> for a white person. And that was the excuse that we heard all the time um, after the initial gender shades audit. 
So doing the follow-up audit where um, Amazon, IBM, and Face++ were all able to, within seven months, release new products and make drastic improvements um, to the performance of their systems in such a short amount of time. It was very clearly not the case. It's clearly something that um, resulted more from the you know, neglect of their evaluation process and neglect of concern for people of color and um, these minority or underrepresented groups, um, rather than, you know, a foundational technical limitation of, of the actual tool. So, um, you know, for one thing, the audits definitely revealed that um, these kind of claims were just, um, you know, um, invalid or um, unsubstantive. Uh, the other thing that happened was, uh, in response to our work, uh, Matt Woods at Amazon Recognition um, had made this claim of, well, you know, we, we recommend that people use really high uh, thresholds, you know, of at least 99%. Um, uh, so, you know, a lot of these biases disappear once you set the threshold very, very high. Um, and uh, a lot of, in response to that response to our work, um, a, you know, a, a couple interesting studies came out after that revealing the nature of how, you know, facial recognition was not necessarily, um, the facial recognition products were not being properly used by the clients in the first place. So despite their kind of foundational dysfunction, um, you know, there was a great investigation in Gizmodo around how um, Amazon's only facial recognition client um, uh, denounced the claim of uh, the threshold recommendation being at 99% with them not even understanding what a threshold was and defaulting to the 80% threshold that we had used, which was the default of the entire system. Um, and then also a great um, report by Georgetown Law called Garbage In, Garbage Out, where they revealed that um, you know, police officers would use celebrity images and sketches um, as input data for, their, for their, um, their, their products, the products that they were using. Um, and then also, you know, um, the whole conversation around the dysfunction of these technologies led to a great and necessary conversation around the misuse, abuse, and weaponization of machine learning. So, um, you know, we didn't coincidentally pick Amazon recognition for our follow-up audit. We, at the, at, at the summer, the summer where we were um, doing that follow-up audit, ACLU had actually uh, just reported on the fact that Amazon was attempting to sell facial recognition products to law enforcement. So we understood that Amazon as a target in order to assess or understand their performance for a particular um, uh, populations of concern was a really important um, question to answer since they were trying to sell their technology in such high stakes environment. Um, so it was even more important for that technology to be um, assessed or to be evaluated for performance. The other thing as well is that, um, you know, they met with ICE at around the same time as well, which revealed just how um, eager they were at the time to deploy or to pitch um, effectively dysfunctional technology in to, to, for use in really high stakes situations. So um, it opened up a whole conversation as well afterwards, after our audit work came out um, and Amazon responded to that. Um, it, it opened up this whole other conversation as well as to, you know, even if this technology was to work, um, there's several situations in which it's still not okay. Um, and that was a conversation that um, I think definitely arose from, you know, for, for one, um, questioning its functionality really helped that product get pulled off the market. Um, and these more nuanced conversations around privacy and consent to arise um, uh, to challenge its use in these high stakes scenarios. So yeah, again, um, not to pick on Amazon, but they just, they've done a lot. <laughs> um, uh, Amazon was also planning to use facial recognition um, to process the data from uh, their Ring product. Uh, it's like a neighborhood um, smart doorbell that would take footage of your porch and you know the street in front of you. And they were planning on um, processing that footage with facial recognition and selling that again as a product. Um, and this was again, a realized harm it was affecting you know it was they were in partnership with more than 400 police forces across the US um, and again um, through um, investigative reporting it was found that their facial recognition system struggled to work um, in many cases and they actually had to manually tag people and there was all sorts of ways in which um, you know um, researchers and reporters 
um, and, and advocates were um, able to justify that this technology was premature and completely inappropriate for the situation they were trying to deploy them in. Um, we also kind of encountered other situations of, you know, facial recognition just being completely weaponized to the point where, you know, it wasn't even a question of bias. It was just a question of this is a harmful technology that we should not deploy in specific situations ever. So, you know, Toronto police was found to use facial recognition secretly without any kind of public consultation or interaction, which is, um, you know, um, very um, disrespectful to the public. Uh, there was a landlord that was trying to use facial recognition in a rent stabilized complex to try to harass the tenants to move out so that he could raise the rent. Um, and then there was also, you know, um, uh, stories of, you know, facial recognition um, research that was focused on identifying specific uh, ethnic subgroups within China and leading to um, an effective targeting of these ethnic subgroups within that country. So again, outside of the realm of bias, um, a lot of what was sparked from the conversation around performance of these systems was a, a broader conversation around, you know, the abuse and the weaponization of this technology. Um, and then I'm also going to just mention really quickly, there was also a lot of interesting responses that we, we, we engaged with and, and led to a lot of work afterwards where, um, you know, there was an interesting conversation around just the violence of gender recognition in the first place and that binary uh, label of male or female being imposed on someone. Um, interesting conversations around critical race theory and the fact that um, to define these subgroups, we sort of had to, um, we looked specifically at phenotypic features, but there were sort of um, follow-up audits that were looking along racial lines and having that be very ambiguously defined. Um, so it was like an interesting conversation that arose from that. Um, and then also this uh, sort of related conversation to this idea of that binary gender label is this more broader conversation around just the labels in our data sets more broadly. So in ImageNet, we have these strange labels of like fo foolish woman, hypocrite. Um, MIT recently pulled down um, a tiny image data set that was full of these racist and misogynistic terms. So um, it, it really brought in the conversation of the construction of these data sets and the social influence on those on that. Um, and then the other thing too is that it led to a conversation around well, there's specific facial recognition classification tasks that are just inherently unscientific. Uh, whether or not it's about bias, but you know, uh, there's there's specific tasks that just will never work. Uh, you, you can't predict fear, uh, an innate emotion, you know, using someone's face. You can't predict um, and similar, and which Amazon was trying to do, um, but you also can't predict like hireability or criminality or uh, any kind of personality trait or sexuality. So um, that was also a conversation that was was in the orbit of our work, which was this idea of um, you know situations where it's completely inappropriate to use facial recognition because facial recognition cannot do that. Um, so that was a really fascinating direction or conversation that happened around account of broader accountability beyond bias. And then the sort of third lesson was um, this idea of audits for participation. So you can make design decisions that can encourage certain types of public government and corporate engagement in response to an audit. Um, and I see I'm a little bit over time, so I'm gonna just rush through this quite quickly, but um, you know, Gender Shades was definitely, you know, Joy paid a lot of attention to making that work incredibly accessible. And as a result of that, it was heavily cited in a lot of bills and lawsuits and letters. Um, and it really traveled far. Um, you know, there's a great resource from Fight for the Future where they, they actually map out all the facial recognition legislation happening um, throughout the U.S. right now. And it really exploded um, last summer throughout this year um, where there's been an incredible conversation happening and engagement um, from the regulatory landscape as to how to um, clamp down on the use, the irresponsible use of this technology and the premature deployment of this technology. Um, the ACLU also really definitely took this on as a project. It, it was not just us. The ACLU was working very tirelessly for years um, to uh, uh, work on this idea of a Community Control Over Policing Surveillance Act. So it was pretty much this template for local municipalities to um, restrict the police use of facial recognition and other surveillance tools. Um, and as part of that work, they definitely mention the lack of functionality and the concerns around functionality for these tools. 
Um, and yeah, you know, right off the bat, as soon as we um, released both Gender Shades and also um, Actionable Auditing, which was the follow-up audit, we would always get these blog posts written by, you know, um, the, you know, the, the, the head of policy from Microsoft or, or Amazon, um, IBM, um, sort of declaring their desire to be regulated. So once it was revealed that, oh, these systems have this inherent bias and are not performing very well, they would release these, um, you know, press releases and it would, tr it would translate into press stories where they would talk about, oh, you know, we actually really support, um, you know, facial recognition regulation. And that's something that we as a company want to see. And it would sort of be like that arbitrary concession speech of, oh, we see that there's problems. We see that this is a dysfunctional system. Um, but we are going to wait for regulation, which we do support. Um, and I'm really glad that that conversation has evolved and matured beyond that, because that was a very sort of vapid stage where, you know, although they were saying that they supported regulation, they were still selling facial recognition products and, so, and trying to sell it to police specifically. Um, so it wasn't really until the George Floyd protest that happened um, this summer that the companies really took, recognized the risk of prematurely deploying this very impactful technology and actually completely pulled out of the market of selling facial recognition products. So they completely backed away from selling facial recognition to police specifically. Um, and that was sort of, uh, it, it evolved the conversation. It definitely wasn't the solution, but it revealed um, uh, an important step forward, which was, the acknowledgement that you can't continue selling this dysfunctional thing, um, you know, while declaring that you're in favor of regulation. Oh. Um, so yeah, this was just me mentioning, you know, that um, it, it's remarkable how, um, you know, our advocacy, but also the advocacy of so many others, including the ACLU, um, you know, shifted Amazon's position from this place of, uh, we refuse to quit to sell flawed and racially biased facial recognition, which was a headline at the time, um, to, um, you know, them deciding to pause uh, police use uh, of its facial recognition software um, only two and a half years later. <laughs> um, and it kind of speaks to um, a broader uh, connection between audit, audit work and participation, where we're really seeing um, this dynamic play out of, uh, you know, with the with the a level situation um the public really uh reacting to uh the fact that an algorithm had made a decision about them and they had lacked agency and they had not been aware um and you know people really becoming engaged in this topic of algorithmic accountability um i don't know if i have time for this i'm going to go through it very quickly but i just wanted also to also make a note on internal uh, algorithmic audits and um participation in this idea of engaging other stakeholders and other and, and the public and how that connects to this idea of internal um, algorithmic audits as well. So internal audits are these audits that are conducted by people within the company. Um, everything I've described, all my work with Algorithmic Justice League were external audits, things that we had done as people not paid by the company. Um, but internal audits also really have a connection to this idea of participation as well. And I just wanted to touch on it, which is, you know, a lot of internal audit mechanisms are anchored to documentation and that ideal of transparency um, and it's really connected to communication so this idea of writing things down capturing engineering decisions for the sake of communicating to internal stakeholders um, uh, and potentially external stakeholders as well as to how the the system functions um, so yeah this was a lot of like my contribution or my involvement in the model cards for model reporting work um, was really advocating for that communication and that being an integral part of the audit outcome for uh, internal audit practice. Um, and you can see here, like a typical model card is just a one pager that goes over the overview of the model and provides space for um, the developers of the model to share details as to what the limitations could be, you know, um, what the ethical concerns could be, but also what the original intent and provenance of the data is, um, just to articulate that for anyone that might encounter that model. Um, and I'm just meant to flag that uh, they're also introducing toolkits, Google's introducing these toolkits to really help people 
streamline the process of building a model card to make it as easy as possible to do so as someone developing or training models. And the hope is that it becomes very commonplace within research and um, within the broader sort of engineering scheme uh, to, to, to develop these model cards. Um, so yeah, here's like an example of a model card if you want to check it out um, from Perspective API, which is sort of uh, a product uh, for Perspective API, which is a product of the Jigsaw team at, Jigsaw team at Google. Um, so that's something that you, if you want to just see what a model card looks like, uh, this is kind of what it looks like in the end. Um, and while I was at the partnership on AI, I also sort of leaned into this question of documentation and communication. And um, there's this about a Mel project where it really is. Uh, so for reference, the partnership on AI is this group of mostly a lot of the tech companies. So Google is a part of the partnership. Microsoft is part of the partnership. DeepMind, um, you know, Amazon, all of these tech companies. Um, and uh, the, the partnership is really anchored or focused on this idea of best practice, best corporate practice. So the About ML project was taking ideas like model cards and data sheets or transparency cards from Microsoft and fact sheets from IBM and trying to pull all of that information together um, to work towards a more solid documentation culture for the field. Um, and then another sort of idea around documentation and how that connects to participation internally um, is a project that I worked on um, called Closing the AI Accountability Gap. And this is part of the work I did at Google, where uh, in addition to this idea of model cards or data sheets or AI principles or product requirements documents, um, you know, in industries such as medicine or aerospace or finance that have a culture of um, having a regulatory obligation to do internal audits, they have all of these other documents. So they have these other documents that they're meant to produce. They have audit checklists that they're meant to produce or social impact statements that they're meant to produce. Um, and uh, for this project, what we did is pretty much survey um, these documents. And we said, well, you know, of all the documents uh, from these other industries that have these internal audit obligations, you know, which of these are sort of relevant to machine learning and how can we adapt these templates for machine learning? Um, so I can't go through this example, but the failure modes and effects analysis is a type of document from the aerospace um, sort of discipline and uh, an industry. And um, we ask the question of, well, you know, in this industry, this is a document that's been useful for them. Is this something that could be useful for machine learning? And here we show that, you know, there's potential for um, a FIMIA to be not just useful in the aerospace context, but also be useful um, for our work in, in machine learning on the product side. So that was pretty much how we led to this Smactor framework, which is us trying to place these documents as part of a methodology for internal auditing. Um, uh, and I encourage you to read this paper to learn more about that. Um, there's things we're still trying to figure out. I, I will go through this very quickly because I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. But um, we wrote a whole paper about things we were still trying to figure out that we were really struggling with. Um, um, and it was mostly in response to the fact that people were just, you know, doing so many gender shade style audits in response to our work. And we were noticing certain mistakes that kept arising and certain ethical tensions that arose. And we wanted to just name that. So that's why we wrote this um, paper called Saving Face, where we talk about the ethical concerns of auditing and how um, audits, these audits themselves are limited and should be properly scoped and properly considered before informing a really important decision. So, um, you know, one tension that we brought up is this idea that, uh, you know, targets are, the impact of uh, this type of audit is so specific to particular demographics, particular prediction tasks in particular companies. So, um, you know, we audited Microsoft, which had been part, part of the initial gender shades audit, <laughs> Amazon, which had been part of the follow-up audit, and Clarify, which had never been audited before. And we see that pattern from the actionable auditing paper that Clarify has that performance gap between the lighter male and darker female subgroup as expected. But, um, you know, for another, and this is for the gender classification task that we've always been auditing, and the companies that had already been previously audited um, did not have that gap with respect to gender classification. But with respect to you know, classifying age, uh, that, that gap between performance on darker female and lighter male or lighter female subgroup um, persisted. 
So, um, you know, although they might have, the, the, the engineers on that team might have actively uh, addressed the issue for, you know, the task, the prediction task that they were being audited for, for other tasks, they did not pay as much attention to that, um, to that issue. Uh, so that was a really interesting finding. Uh, there's also this idea of, uh, you know, our benchmark, this is the pilot parlance benchmark, uh, is highly, you know, uh, has inherent biases with respect to age representation, obviously most of the faces in that data set being middle aged. So there's always going to be a dimension of bias in any test set um, requiring this sort of very intentional choice around how to set up the subgroups for the user representative test set. So that's like another tension or another ethical issue with respect to how these audits actually work and play out. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to, we were going to mention is sort of this idea of, um, you know, Amazon was really uh, re sort of resisted our results in a way that we ha weren't used to. Um, and um, it required a lot of support from the research community to really, you know, back our work up. But even with the coordinated vulnerability disclosure, there were certain companies that were still quite hostile, um, Amazon being one of them. So we're not really sure how to deal with that kind of situation where even if you uh, disclose everything appropriately and the company is still very hostile or defensive. Um, there's also the issue of the IBM's response to our work, which was this diversity and faces project where they, in response to our work, decided to build, um, you know, the biggest face data set of as many diverse faces as possible. And they sourced their faces from Flickr without the consent of um, the subjects of the images. And as a result, there was an inherent um, uh, sort of tension and backlash that they experienced where people uh, were not ready to trade their privacy for the sake of them addressing the, the bias issues in the performance of their system. So that tension between privacy and fairness um, is something that became a recurring theme. Um, and yeah, there was just a, not just in terms of IBM's situation with Flickr, but um, there were other situations of just people exploiting minority groups in order to collect more data for them to diversify their data sets, you know, tokenizing particular groups for the sake of that. Um, so there was a lot of things to really pay attention to when advocating for diversifying data or diversifying the data itself in order to address the bias concerns. And um, we were very aware of how these audits would sort of set up the problem to just optimize for performance on our new benchmark rather than really thinking critically about these other ethical issues. Um, and then, you know, another issue, and I'm, I think I'm ending here, um, is this idea of uh, access. So after we had audited Kairos, um, they made their cheapest <laughs> offering $99. Um, they created this paywall effectively um, to not allow for anyone to just casually audit their system. Um, and we, we saw this in a couple other situations as well with, you know, um, Amazon temporarily making their demo um, private um, and other groups just um, making it so that um, as auditors, we can no longer access their system and that could, that would discourage us from actually doing any kind of Suzuki or follow up audit. Um, and, you know, uh, th there's still a path forward here where ACLU recently um, won a case with Christian Sandvig where now it's legal for academic researchers doing this work to be able to um, uh, you know, violate, uh, you know, uh, terms of service for the sake of, of being able to do this audit work. Um, and it was pretty much just a legal protection of researchers that might need to do a little bit of hacking in order to get the access they need um, for these audit or discrimination studies. Um, so that was a win by the ACLU to protect people doing this work um, so that there's no risk of sort of litigation or um, uh, action against us. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much uh, where we are uh, with respect to this work right now. And um, yeah, our kind of uh, concluding sentiment is this idea that, uh, you know, discussing algorithmic fairness is really not enough. We need to think about justice. It's a much more holistic conversation. Um, uh, and it requires so much more than just the, you know, myopic focus on bias, but a much more um, a nuanced and complex conversation of a lot of the broader ethical issues of these deployed systems. Uh, and I'm going to end there. 
Ted, thanks so much for the fascinating talk and inspiring all of us, uh, faculty and students included. I, I think really a uh, testament to your work is the, are the number of studies that uh, followed on uh, with, with auditing and even more uh, seeing the, the attitudes and some of the practices changing at the, the major corporate uh, players. So uh, I have questions, but I think I should turn it, turn it over to our audience first. Uh, to see if anybody would like to pose a question. Uh, I can moderate the chat, uh, but maybe you could also use uh, the Zoom hands up uh, raise hand feature. If you'd like to ask a question, I'll, I'll moderate. Oh, I see one uh, as I was scrolling by. Okay, Gus has a question. Go ahead. Uh, I actually just saw Eric, so you should let the people go first, um, and, then I, and then I can jump in after others have had the chance. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Eric did pop up just uh, just after you. So Eric, uh, Eric's a postdoc uh, at Vector Institute. You're on. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, Ted. This talk was incredible. It was super cool. Um, I'm wondering. So I'm really interested in XAI, and I'm wondering if the audits ever get into explaining, or are they just about performance? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think right now they're about performance uh, or they were for a very long time about performance. I, I think there is a communication element to it though. Um, and that's increasingly important. Like I mentioned that kind of third lesson we learned around audits as a mode of engagement uh, for public participation, for regulatory participation, for corporate engagement. Um, uh, we found that, so I think with XAI, um, you know, the goal is to really explain uh, you know, the path through which a model makes a decision or the, the, the sort of steps the model make, takes to make a decision. And I don't think audit work is as focused on that as it is, you know, the actual outcome. Um, but that being said, the, you know, the sort of nominal notion of explanation and that idea of um, communicating um, to a broader audience about, you know, how a system might work or might not work for their particular group um, is something that is definitely within the realm of what uh, we talk about in this space um, where we're very concerned around how do we communicate or how do we how do we discover what the model's performance means for this particular group um, you know if there's an advocacy group that comes representing a segment of the affected population what can we tell them about the risk of this particular model to them and to people that have a similar uh, profile to them so I think that's something that definitely um, XAI has been helpful in terms of trying to navigate. Thank you. You're muted, muted Graham. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I see Josephine, who's a, uh, finishing a master's with Gus in, in the Department of Philosophy, also runs a consulting uh, agency around, around developing skills for good and training corporate training. So uh, Josephine, question, uh, next question is, is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Graham. Deb, thank you so much for your very compelling presentation. And as a lawyer pursuing a specialization in AI ethics, I'm very excited about um, providing AI audits to uh, large companies that want to do good and, and, and comply with the law. My question is, there, I read that uh, bias is the original sin of algorithms and that there are 21 statistical definitions of fairness. So I wonder if you're seeing uh, a development in respect of using human rights as the basis of ensuring that the gap of algorithmic accountability is closed in a way in respect of determining the right of equality and non-discrimination as well as the right of privacy. Yeah, human rights, um, there's a little bit of a, a tension that arises sometimes in these communities where, um, you know, some people appreciate the framing of ethics so they appreciate the framing of like ai principles statements and um you know a particular set of ethical ideals or ethical expectations and and they they frame and this is this happens a lot internally at these tech companies where they'll frame um you know their internal audit around achieving you know uh, particular ethical expectations around transparency for example or privacy which is actually um 
a little bit more fluid, flexible language than human rights, which I think is a higher standard probably, where, um, you know, we have our set of human rights that you have to adhere to, and it's much less flexible as to what constitutes or what does not constitute a human right. So um, I think companies have been hesitant to embrace it as a result of that. <laughs> but um, there's been human rights assessments that have happened at Facebook. Um, at Google, they had a human rights assessment for their, um, and it's, it's public. Um, so uh, Facebook, had their human rights assessment is quite public. Um, Google had a human rights assessment that's less public, but publicly available on um, uh, their, uh, they had a product, uh, uh, sort of facial recognition product for celebrity identification, and they had a human rights rights assessment on that. Um, so I'd encourage you to check those out because I think um, it reveals that kind of uh, tension where um, even a company that does want to do right um, might find the standard of human rights to be quite difficult to adhere to. So there's that inherent tension of, well, do we want to pressure them anyways? <laughs> um, so I think that that happens, uh, and and like sometimes it definitely leads to sort of attention between the camp of people that are advocating for these more sort of flexible ethical goals versus um, a harder stand using using human rights. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, I, I wanted to say a hi because I noticed some student names from the One Health uh, Collaborative Specialization who I spoke to last week and uh, so thanks for joining us because we've invited them to join our seminars and they have a requirement in their program to attend seminars of different groups on campus. So I think that's a really awesome uh, requirement in that program. Uh, I see, um, I'm trying to see if there's other hands other than Gus's, but I'm seeing Gus's hand. So let's let's go to Gus. Okay, that's that's good, because it, it does sort of follow up um, on, on the previous question. So Deb, I just want to say thanks. Like your work, as I mentioned, has been influential. A lot of the stuff that we're trying to do here at, at University of Guelph. So just thank you. It's, it's been amazing. Um, and I guess I want to just share a worry I've had uh, and, and see if you've sort of experienced um, this in, in your work with doing these audits with companies. So, um, you know, I sometimes teach in the business school and the language of audits um, does seem to like really clearly invoke this idea of like heavily regulated industries like finance, right? And so audits are these things that um, are really focused on compliance with the law. And so I, I've sort of been kind of like queasy myself lately thinking about like, well, do we actually really want to, does it make sense to talk about ethics audits? Because the idea might be that by at least like that association that people might have with audits where it's sort of mere compliance with the law, the worry is that it, it sort of shuts down exactly the kind of discussions that, that you guys talk about in the, in the Saving Face paper, right? Like the questions about should we be doing this in the first place? And like, um, while those ethical issues may be more slippery, I think they're important to have. And so I, I just wonder if like strategically the language of audits has this effect of sort of foreclosing some of the more bigger picture ethical questions that, that you guys raise in like the Saving Face paper. Yeah, I, I I love that question. I um yeah, I think I think I think about that all the time. <laughs> um yeah, I, I think that like there was a point. Um, there's also that intention between, um you know, some of these audit proposals coming internally, where it's like, what does it mean to do an internal audit versus be an you know an outside stakeholder doing an audit? Like, is one more valid than the other? That's also another sort of very common tension. Um, to address the tension around um uh you know these more functionality oriented audits um sort of stealing attention from these broader ethical questions that's something that me um we joined tim to talk about all the time and we're very worried about i think our where we've settled so I've, I've i've settled on a couple points which i'll just share but it's very much still something that we talk about but um where i've sort of settled on this is one um you know um in terms of regulation, um, I definitely see that, by the way, there's, you know, people attempting to deploy machine learning products in healthcare, in aerospace, in finance, in these highly regulated industries. And um, the products that emerge in those spaces, the regulation definitely has holes that don't um, encompass machine learning. So even in those highly regulated spaces, machine learning and AI, broadly speaking, algorithms are still highly unregulated they're kind of these like loose cannons where there's not a lot of checks and balances with respect to um data provenance for example how you label your data simple questions like that uh, documentation requirements are 
nowhere to be seen. So um, it's such an unregulated free for all space that we have this proliferation of systems that don't work, making claims that they do being widely deployed as in affecting millions of people in, in specific countries. So I feel like um, because that's the situation with AI today, I think we're get, trying to get to a point where we can pull that back a little bit and measure things to, to just start with the conversation of functionality to say, well, a lot of what we're widely deploying <laughs> um, doesn't actually work. And as a result of that, this is not something that can just be a free for all. We actually have to have some kind of regulation or even if it's within a regulated space, there needs to be a more conscious decision to, uh, to translate that regulation for this new type of data-driven technology. So I feel like um, that is one contribution of this audit work and pointing to these functionality issues is that it automatically uh, uh, sort of calls out the, the snake oil. It, it calls out the fact that a lot of what's there in industry today is just are just things that don't work or only work for sort of the default population in the minds of you know a set of people that it doesn't actually work for a lot of the um, population that might be uh, targeted by those systems or a lot of the population that might be typically neglected in a product development cycle so I think that like that's like one interesting and valuable thing that audit audits do is that they they point out the places where it doesn't work in a world where we've kind of gotten to, we've kind of assumed that these systems work well enough to widely deploy um, so I think that it's been really good for that, just leading to recalls <laughs> of uh, faulty products in the same way that like with the Covair, um, you know, after the report of the functionality issues with the Covair, it was recalled, right? So I think that that idea of audits servicing recalls um, is, is something that I'm beginning to see as like a very valid outcome. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that as we saw with the facial recognition product, I think audits are ineffective when... Um, People just use it as an excuse to sort of uh, like if I pass this audit, uh, then I'm going to deploy it and it's good enough. To, so I feel like that's what shuts down these broader conversations because people are like, oh, well, you know, I tested my facial recognition system on PPB and we have a zero point X percent, um, you know, disparity. And thus um, and I and my stance on that is that um it's like a necessary but insufficient condition where like if you if you pass ppb there's nothing remarkable about it um it's like a very low bar if you trip on the bar that's incredibly remarkable in the worst way possible but if you pass it there's nothing remarkable about it and there's all of these other conversations like you mentioned more nuanced conversations that will likely take longer um that need to happen on the other side of that so for example with um the facial recognition stuff that's happening um once these products were revealed to be dysfunctional um, and after years of advocacy, um, the, you know, Amazon for that year pulled their, their, system, their systems out of the market. Um, they're also investing in like lobbyists like crazy. Every single <laughs> facial recognition bill that I look at has like two Amazon lobbyists on it. It's insane. So for the next year, they're also investing in stripping away as much regulation as possible so they can come back with even more force. Um, so I, I do think that there's this tension that needs to happen where it, the requirements have to involve a, a broader, deeper conversation than just functionality. Um, and I've, I'm hopeful that might happen for facial recognition, um, for other algorithms, um, you know, thinking of like in the finance industry, a lot of the algorithms that are now being deployed for like loan management, for example, like that's like hard to visualize the public doesn't care as much <laughs> so those are conversations where um you know people might think like oh if i fix the bias i fix the issue and that, and that genuinely concerns me yeah so it's a little bit hard to play the game but i in my mind i've kind of landed in this place of like pointing out dysfunctionality can lead to you know abolition or recall like it can lead to the removal of the system to just point out that it doesn't work um in addition to possibly leading to this like zeal for you know reforming or redesigning the system to fit this new target so it's a really weird tension okay so i know angus has a question but i'm sorry <laughs> angus you've got a direct line to deb uh and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. angus was very courteous and said you know i can ask deb after the, the meeting so uh i'm gonna wrap it up because we're almost at 1 30. Uh, I know that many of us who teach in, in the various programs here are already thinking about your, your recorded video now as maybe the you know, assigned viewing and a, a conversation starter. 
uh, and maybe not maybe a unit, maybe even more, right? Maybe a course all around uh, auditing. It's like I said before, it's something we want to get our students to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, really uh, happy that you've kicked off the literature here and also, um, you know, gave us a lot uh, to, to talk about and, and consider. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's awesome to see stuff coming from a fellow Canadian. So <laughs> um, all the best yeah. and looking forward to your future work uh, with Angus and, and everything to come. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so lots of positive okay. comments in the chat. Bye, everybody. We'll <laughs> see you at the next uh, Curie seminar. Have a great rest of the day. Okay. Bye, Deb. Thanks. Great talk. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll talk later.